My name is Lucy Horowitz, and it's a pleasure to welcome you all to a conversation between New Zionist Congress and Professor Daniel Schwartz. For those of you who don't know, New Zionist Congress is a brand new organization which seeks to empower the next generation of Jewish leaders. Through our book clubs, weekly discussions, and conversations with Jewish leaders just like this one, we dive into the complexities of Israel, life in the diaspora, Jewish history and culture, anti-Semitism, and current events. Professor Daniel B. Schwartz specializes in modern European and American Jewish intellectual, cultural, and urban history at the George Washington University. He is the author of Ghetto, The History of the Word, Spinoza's Challenge to Jewish Thought, writings on his life, philosophy, and legacy, and the first modern Jew, Spinoza and the History of an Image, which was a finalist for the 2012 National Jewish Book Award. He is currently working on two projects, a history of the reception of Karl Marx in Jewish thought and culture, and a history of the Jewish Lower East Side. His research, his research interests include Jews in the city, Jewish historical consciences, early modern and modern Jewish identities, Jewish secularism, Jewish socialism, and Jewish intellectuals. Thank you, Professor Schwartz, for joining us tonight. To tune into more conversations like this one, make sure to follow New Zionist Congress on Twitter at New Zionists, Instagram at New Zionist Congress, and sign up to become a member of our organization at NewZionists.com. So Professor Schwartz, our first question. Can you briefly explain to our listeners the early emergence of Zionism as a political movement? What fueled its passionate supporters? Where and how did it originate? Sure, and first of all, thank you for inviting me and thank you for the work uh, that you're doing. So Zionism as a political movement uh, essentially emerges in the 1880s. Now, that's not to say that there weren't certain intellectuals who were beginning to articulate a kind of modern Jewish nationalism, even a nationalism that had some type of territorial dimension. Uh, but as a movement, uh, it only really surfaces in the 1880s. Uh, and it comes on the heels of these major pogroms against Jews in the Russian Empire, starting in 1881 and 1882, and only really petering out in 1884. So there was um, a Russian Jewish intellectual named Leo Pinsker, uh, who in response to the pogroms and to the kind of worsening of Russian anti-Semitism and to the disappointment of some hopes uh, that Russia might move in a more liberal, liberal direction. He wrote a work called Auto-Emancipation uh, in which he basically argued that emancipation or the granting of Jews of citizenship in their host nations uh, was not going to solve the Jewish question uh, there was, we argued, this kind of Judea, Judeophobia. Uh, and he developed a whole uh, kind of interesting explanation of that Judeophobia. But the key is uh, that this was a, an important work written in German um, that argued in favor of Jewish nationalism with a territorial dimension uh, and argued that only that would lead to a possible solution of what was typically called, starting in the 19th century, the Jewish question. So at that time, there emerges a movement called the Lovers of Zion movement. And this was mostly an East European Jewish movement um, that uh, began to send Jews from primarily Eastern Europe to Palestine to establish agricultural colonies, and some just to move to the cities. Uh, but this was a movement that is often associated with what in Zionist historiography is called the first Aliyah, the first kind of major wave of Jewish immigration to Palestine under the auspices of Zionism. I should say it was not called Zionism at this time. Uh, we believe the term Zionism originated at around 1890. Uh, this was known as the Lovers of Zion, or Chovei Tzion. So this movement, um, you know, lasts throughout the 1880s into the 1890s, uh, 
Um, but ultimately, uh, even though the first Aliyah continues, it kind of peters out. And then you have what I would call as a second stage in the emergence of Zionism as a political movement. Uh, and that was the result of the kind of volt fass of a Austrian Jewish intellectual named Theodor Herzl. Uh, Herzl had been a very cosmopolitan Jew, um, someone who was kind of the epitome of the assimilated Jew. Uh, he was a playwright. Uh, he uh, was a, a writer for the leading liberal newspaper in Vienna. Uh, and starting in the 1890s, uh, for reasons that historians continue to debate, uh, it used to be believed it was a result, it was a response to uh, the infamous Dreyfus affair in France. Uh, most historians say believe it to be more complicated, that there were roots even before that. Uh, but in 1896, he publishes a work called in German, Der Judenstadt, which is typically translated as the Jewish state, in which he laid out his critique of, anti of emancipation uh, and his argument that in order to solve the Jewish question, there would have to be some kind of uh, political, diplomatic, territorial solution. And initially he was open to where it would be located, where a potential Jewish territory, Jewish homeland would be located, whether it would be Palestine, whether it might be Argentina. Um, but ultimately uh, he creates uh, the Zionist organization. He basically convenes in 1897, the first Zionist Congress, uh, which had delegates from Europe and the United States as well. Uh, and this is where they endorse a program uh, that seeks the creation of a Jewish homeland. They don't say state, they say a Jewish homeland in Palestine. Um, and And that's really the beginnings of Zionism as a political movement. It will have its ups and downs you know, from 1896-97 through the establishment of the State of Israel in 1948. Uh, but I would point to those two um, events, um, the Cholvetzion, the Lovers of Zion movement in the 1880s, and the Zionist organization created by Herzl in 1897. And what did anti-Semitism and Jew hatred look like at the time of its birth? What factors contributed to these attitudes? Okay, great question. Also a somewhat complicated question uh, because anti-Semitism, um, even though it emerged in different places more or less simultaneously, it didn't always have the same complexion. Uh, so, I mean, anti-Semitism, uh, as a political movement, emerges first in Germany in 1879. Um, and this came on the heels of Jews receiving uh, in 1871, a more or less complete emancipation. There are still some areas that from which Jews were barred, if not by law, then by custom. Uh, but Jews finally gained citizenship in a now united Germany. So uh, some of the anti-Semitism that emerges in Germany is focused on rolling back this emancipation, arguing that Jews are playing a disproportionate role, that they are controlling the economy, they're controlling the press, um, they're taking too prominent a role in in the national culture, and that you know they need to be kind of re reduced to size. So in Germany, it's very related to a kind of anti-emancipationist politics. And in other states where Jews had already gained emancipation, where anti-Semitism spreads, it has a similar uh, dimension to it. Um, but as I mentioned before, uh, there were also all of a sudden in the 1880s pogroms against Jews in Eastern Europe, in the Russian Empire to be specific. Uh, and these pogroms would happen episodically, really, I mean, getting worse and worse through the post-World War I period. 
Uh, so first of all, this is something you had in Eastern Europe that you really didn't have in Western and Central Europe, namely physical violence against Jews. Moreover, this was a place where Jews had not yet gained emancipation. Jews only gained emancipation uh, with the March Revolution in 1917. Uh, so it was in a sense an attempt um, to kind of arrest Jews where they were, uh, to keep them, to uh, further isolate them. Instead of kind of like opening up more opportunities for advancement, uh, there was the imposition of quotas, uh, a tightening of segregation in the area where most Jews were restricted to live, namely the Pale of Settlement. Um, and, and some of it was a more kind of like traditional Christian anti-Judaism, uh, rather than what was emerging in, beginning to emerge in, in Germany at the time as a racial anti-Semitism. Uh, now, racial anti-Semitism is not so widespread uh, before you know, the Nazis make it a, a central part of their platform. Uh, but there were already um, anti-Semites who were espousing a kind of racial anti-Semitism that basically said that Jewishness is a kind of immutable biological uh, category, uh, that it can't be simply washed away you know, through baptism, through conversion. That is essential to um, the Jewish character. Uh, so this was a kind of biological understanding of race, a pseudo-biological understanding of race that viewed Jewishness as something indelible and that viewed Jews as a inferior, but also a very cunning race. Um, in many ways is the epitome of a modernity that was seen as threatening uh, of a traditional way of life, uh, and, and corrosive of traditional communities. So, you know, this is, this is what anti-Semitism more or less looks like uh, when Zionism emerges as a political movement. And I would say really, and I mentioned it before, but one of the most shocking anti-Semitic events of the 19th century, of the late 19th century, was the Dreyfus Affair in France, which you know happened more or less co coincides with the emergence of the Zionist organization under Herzl. Uh, this was the framing of a Jewish captain of espionage uh, that led him to be kind of dishonorably discharged um, in very public ceremony. Uh, there were cries of, you know, death to the Jews. And this ultimately became a huge scandal when it was you know, revealed that the military had essentially involved, uh, you know, involved itself in framing and then was trying to perpetuate a cover-up. Uh, but the fact this happened in France, even though anti-Semitism is worsening in France in the 1880s and 1890s, the fact that it happened in France, the first nation in Europe to emancipate its Jews was seen as especially shocking and was taken by many Zionists as a kind of proof that emancipation would not solve the Jewish question. And what were the characteristics of anti-Zionism at this time? And what are the key differences between that 19th century version and what we see today? Um, okay, so in terms of anti-Zionism, you know, in the late 19th, early 20th century, anti-Zionism is primarily an intra-Jewish movement, and or I, I wouldn't even call it a movement. It's a it's a it's a, a, tr a tendency that you see in different sectors of the Jewish population. So, for example, most Orthodox Jews at the creation of Zionism were steadfastly opposed to it. They had various reasons for opposing it. One reason was because they interpreted it as a kind of active messianism. And they kind of clung fast to a tradition that it was not um, the initiative of the Jews themselves 
to bring about the redemption. That was in God's hands alone. And that Jews shouldn't take steps to hasten the redemption, that this was a process that in the past had led to false messiahs. So this was one ground for opposing Zionism, the conception of messianism. They also saw that many of the Zionists, like Herzl, for example, were extremely secular Jews. And so they opposed it simply for its secularism. So you have, on the one hand, the kind of orthodox, uh, ultra-orthodox Haredi opposition to Zionism that emerges from the very outset. You also have opposition to Zionism among more assimilated Jews, more acculturated Jews, Jews who are identified with liberal Judaism, with the reform movement. Uh, in 1897, when the first Zionist Congress is convened uh, in Basel, who initially was planned for Munich, uh, but there was an outcry uh, by German rabbis spanning the spectrum, mostly reform, but spanning the spectrum, who oppose Zionism uh, because uh, they had argued throughout the 19th century that Jews were essentially a religion uh, and that they may have formerly been a nationality, but that with their integration into states like Germany, they essentially had become Germans of the mosaic persuasion. So they oppose Zionism uh, as a kind of distortion of what they believe Jewish identity should be. And they probably also were worried that Zionism would raise questions about dual loyalty. Now, then you had members of the left, uh, Jewish members of the left. And I would say both people who were affiliated with um, you know, left-wing socialist parties like the Russian Social Democratic Party, the Polish Social Democratic Party, which espoused a kind of strict Marxist line uh, that basically argued that the Jewish question would be solved through assimilation, through revolution, uh, and that any kind of Jewish nationalism per se would be reactionary. Uh, there were also Jewish socialists who emerged at this time. Uh, some of whom are committed to a kind of Jewish national autonomism, a kind of cultural autonomy, who um, believed that Jewish culture, in particular Yiddish culture, should be cultivated, should be developed, uh, but they remained committed to kind of international revolution and opposed to Zionism as something they interpreted as a largely bourgeois movement, and it's something that wouldn't solve the Jewish question. It would only you know, deal with the issues of a minority of Jews at best. So there's a whole spectrum of opposition to Zionism from within the Jewish world, really leading up, you know, beginning to change in the 1930s somewhat, as some of the kind of feelings began to soften about Zionism. Uh, but, you know, there are groups in the United States that are opposing Jewish groups. Uh, one group in particular, the American Council of Judaism, that is strictly anti-Zionist, you know, in 1948, arguing against the creation of the state of Israel. There were also uh, proponents of a binational state uh, that would not be uh, exclusively Jewish or Arab, but that would basically be you know, politically somewhat neutral and then allow for the kind of cultural nationalism of both groups. So, you know, what I would say is that after the creation of the state of Israel, and really in many ways after the Six Day War in, in 1967, you know, Zionism becomes one of the unifying factors of most Jews around the world. Now, it may just you know, differ in the degree of Zionism, how actively held a position it is. Are you prepared to make Aliyah? Uh, do you just kind of support Israel philanthropically? Uh, but you know, it emerges as a position that has the loyalty of most Jews. But that's not to say all Jews. And some of what you see today within the Jewish community of anti-Zionism, uh, 
is, you know, there are some traces of the intra-Jewish developments that I was talking about earlier, you know, particularly on the Jewish left. Um, so what I would say is though, the anti-Zionism today, um, I don't wanna, you know, there is a right-wing anti-Zionism as well. And that sometimes gets lost in the shuffle, uh, but it has become uh, since the Six Day War and since the left really embraced kind of decolonization as its major cause, uh, it's emerged as primarily a movement associated with the left. Um, it was associated with the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc. Uh, it led to the kind of infamous Zionism is racism resolution in the UN in 1975. Um, there was a conference held in Durban, South Africa in 2001 uh, that was not only clearly anti-Zionist, but also anti-Semitic. Um, so that's one of the ways in which anti-Zionism is different today is that it's increasingly becoming associated with the progressive left. Um, and, but I would say that you still see uh, you know, Jews and particularly younger Jews uh, who are more lukewarm in their feelings to Israel, even you know, hostile in their feelings to Israel. So some of this kind of intra-Jewish developments that I discussed earlier, I'm repeating myself, but you still see traces of it today. And a common critique today often of Zionism is that it was a colonial movement. That's certainly a different interpretation than many Jews, how many Jews consider the political phenomenon today. So where, why do you think there is that stark difference of opinions? Um, okay, well, I mean, in terms of why there's a difference of opinions, I would say in the Jewish part, it's because Jews see themselves as returning to their ancestral homeland. They feel that they have a very deep historical ties to the land itself. Uh, and that even though Zionism is a modern movement that emerged at the same time, you know, nationalisms were proliferating in Europe in the 19th century. Uh, nevertheless, they argue that Jews had always been a nationality uh, and that a commitment to Zion was deeply embedded in their traditions so that they see themselves as having returned to their homeland. Whereas from the perspective of Palestinians and the supporters of Palestinians, the Zionists were essentially seen as usurpers. Now, you know, in terms of the whole Zionism is what is Zionism colonialism debate? Um, it depends on what kind of colonialism you're talking about in terms of perceiving certain similarities. Zionism, at least initially, certain wasn't certainly wasn't the kind of colonialism that involved you know, sending citizens from a host nation, from a metropole, to kind of exploit the natural resources of a land, uh, you know, to uh, use a cheap labor force, uh, and to basically still kind of retain ties, and to kind of send, you know, resources to that home nation. Uh, you know, Jews who were moving to Palestine during the first Aliyah, during the second Aliyah, during the third Aliyah, they were really severing their ties from the places where they were coming from. Now, scholars have argued for there being a, a certain kind of colonialism, which they refer to as settler colonialism. And settler colonialism, they argue, doesn't involve necessarily moving to a place with the idea of lording it over the population, exploiting it, uh, but of creating permanent colonies, colonies that end up through their expansion displacing native peoples. So Israel would not be in the only the only country in the category of kind of settler colonial um, examples. The United States could be cited as a settler colonial society. Australia could be cited as an example of a settler colonial. Um, model. And there are some issues with the settler colonial interpretation as well. Uh, but this is what I would say most people who look at the origins of Zionism and say Zionism from its very inception was colonialist. They'll typically argue that Zionism was a form of settler colonialism. 
Now, then it becomes more complicated um, with the emergence of the British mandate for Palestine after the British conquer Palestine uh, from the Ottoman Turks in 1918. And a, a year earlier, they issued the Balfour Declaration, which commits Britain to the establishment of a Jewish national home. Uh, here, they, you know, people would argue that Britain became involved in helping uh, to facilitate the emergence of a kind of Jewish national infrastructure in Palestine. Now, you know, ultimately the British would kind of like sour on this project of creating a Jewish national home and it would eventually pretty much wash their hands of it. Uh, but there are people who would look at the kind of the British role, you know, I mean, Arabs, in Palestine, you know, tended to be as anti-British as they were anti-Zionist, uh, because they viewed the British Empire uh, as having uh, not only kind of, you know, um, imposed itself and a population who didn't want it there, but actually helping a population that they perceived as usurpers create um, the foundations of a Jewish national home. Now, I would say. You know, post-1967, um, you would have a much stronger argument for saying that Zionism, at least as applied in the occupied territories, is a colonial movement. Um, it creates settlements, civilian settlements. Um, it, uh, you know, seizes resources like land and water. Um, it um, often really does see uh, Palestinians in the West Bank as a cheap labor force. So there are definitely more um, echoes of a kind of, not simply a settler colonialism, but a more, you know, what people associate uh, with European colonialism. Uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's, that's basically how I would say why Jews don't perceive it as a colonial, well, I shouldn't say Jews, well, yeah, well, most Jews don't perceive it as a colonial movement, uh, but it is perceived as such, not only by Palestinian, but also by many scholars. Would you say that anti-Zionism after 1948 constitutes a form of anti-Semitism? Are some forms anti-Semitic and some not? And would you say that some forms contribute to violence against Jews today? Yeah. Right, so that's the $64,000 question. This is what you know. I, I knew we were getting to. So here's how I would answer that very complex question. I would say that anti-Zionism is not ipso facto anti-Semitic. That is to say that it is conceivably possible to oppose the existence of a Jewish sovereign state um, for reasons that don't have to do with a hatred of Jews. Um, and I should say, by the way, that, you know, during this earlier period that I discussed, um, you know, when Zionism is just getting off the ground and facing all this resistance, uh, you know, it never alleges anti-Semitism against those who are opposed to Zionism. Really that accusation for the most part, dates to the 1970s, um, when you had a kind of anti-Zionism on the part of the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc that was very much wedded to a kind of anti-Semitism uh, within you know, their own countries or multinational empires. So, you know, I would say that anti-Zionism is not ipso facto anti-Semitic. There are Jewish anti-Zionists, or at least Jewish cr critics of Zionism uh, as, you know, a kind of requiring sovereignty, who I don't think are anti-Semitic. You know, I know some of them were my colleagues, and I don't see in them any hatred of Jews. I don't think Peter Beinart, for example, who was kind of famously or infamously, infamously, depending on your perspective, basically, you know, uh, and now rejects the idea of Jewish sovereignty. Uh, I would not describe him as an anti-Semite. He's an Orthodox Jew who is deeply committed to his Judaism, uh, who has taken a fairly radical position uh, 
on Zionism in Israel. But the reality is that anti-Zionism very often morphs into anti-Semitism. They're not necessarily uh, identical, uh, but it's a slippery slope. And so when you see a kind of anti-Zionism that demonizes Israel as a Nazi state, or as the kind of the uniquely evil state, or as some kind of state manipulating uh, world finance, or raising questions about loyalty of Jews, or specifically when it leads to a kind of targeting of Jews um, around the world, um, then anti-Zionism has become anti-Semitism. And I think what we're seeing is that that is all too common. Uh, you know, at Durban in 2001, uh, you know, it wasn't just anti-Zionism, right? I mean, there were pictures of Jews as baby killers. You know, when you see kind of almost like modern blood libels applied, you know, to Israel and Zionism, that's the one I would say anti-Zionism, you know, has really become anti-Semitism. Now, there are people who would not agree with me. There are people who would say that anti-Zionism is anti-Semitism uh, because it opposes the will of Jews essentially to have self-determination uh, in the land of Israel. And, and also, I mean, that, that being not simply a position that's you know, supported by most Israelis, but even by most Jews around the world. So they would argue the two are tantamount. I don't think they are necessarily identical, but I think that one very anti-Zionism very frequently is either driven by anti-Semitism, is a kind of mask for it, or it morphs into it. While we're on the subject of anti-Semitism, can you explain what this specific hatred is and where did it come from, the origins of anti-Semitic tropes we still see today and how it specifically differed in the transition from the Middle Ages to enlightened Europe? Sure. Um, you know, I mean, in terms of anti-Semitic tropes, many of these are quite old and date back you know, to late antiquity, the Middle Ages, things like the blood libel, for example, um, Jews as conspiratorial. You know, there's an, there are ideas of worldwide Jewish conspiracy in the Middle Ages, Jews as kind of associates of the devil, kind of thinking of Jews as uniquely evil. Um, you know, all of this is part of the medieval heritage. Um, What's new about anti-Semitism as it emerges in the 19th century is first of all, the dimension of racial anti-Semitism. Now, there are people who could say, even this we see certain antecedents for in the early modern period. Uh, if you look at early modern Spain, for example, uh, the animus directed against the new Christians, uh, those uh, who had formerly been Jews, sometimes generations back, uh, but who had converted to Christianity. Uh, and after 1492 had to, if they wanted to remain in Spain, otherwise they were expelled. Um, they were targeted. Uh, and there were often, there were the creation of these purity of blood statutes that in order to kind of enter into certain sectors of society, one needed to prove that one was an old Christian, not a new Christian. So already you see here some kind of idea of Jewishness as indelible, that conversion doesn't entirely wash it away. I should say the church always opposed this uh, because it was committed to the idea of converting the Jews. In any case, but one thing that is really kind of becomes prominent in the 19th century is this kind of pseudo-biological racial anti-Semitism that, you know, for the most part, Prior to modernity, Judaism is seen, there is an outlet, right? At the outlet is conversion. You can be saved if you can convert. You can cease to be Jewish. And that's precisely what this racial dimension of modern anti-Semitism argues against. 
modern anti-Semitism also develops a much more elaborate conspiratorial ideology that views Jews as this kind of like ultimate power behind the curtain, who are manipulating world events, who are the kind of creators of both capitalism and communism, uh, who are basically destroying the old world uh, and bring in this new deracinated, um, horrible world, a world of all sorts of upheavals and revolutions. So I would say the racial dimension is kind of much more elaborate conspiratorial dimension. Um, these are things I would associate with modern anti-Semitism. And in both medieval Europe and modern Europe, what was the purpose of the ghetto in relation to this? What political, religious, and cultural effects did they have on Jews and their surrounding societies? Okay, um, that's a very good question. Um, it's a little bit of a complicated question because, you know, one of the things I argue in my book is that not all ghettos have the same motivation behind them. Now, it's true to say that the ghetto as an institution can mainly be associated with the counter reformation or the Catholic Reformation in Italy, uh, when there is an attempt uh, to um, really tighten the screws on Jews in order to kind of accelerate their conversion. This was what motivated, for example, the creation of the ghetto in Rome in 1555. Um, there was already another ghetto that had been created, the first ghetto that had been created in Venice in 1516. And of course, this was motivated by animus against Jews to a degree. Uh, but what I argue is, is that in this case, the ghetto was a kind of compromise uh, between those who wanted to allow Jews to live in the city so they could basically serve as moneylenders uh, to the local population, particularly the poor, um, to those who wanted to expel the Jews altogether, which is, and really Venice did not have a long history of allowing a kind of openly Jewish community to live there. So it was a kind of compromise measure between acceptance and expulsion, a halfway house between acceptance and expulsion. You're not going to allow Jews to live throughout the city. They're gonna to have to live circumscribed in a particular quarter that is kind of bricked over, that has a wall, that has gates, that has a curfew, um, but you're not going to expel the Jews altogether. And I should say expulsion at this time was very much the norm in Western and Central Europe. Um, when you know, Jews are being expelled from England, from France, um, from various German principalities and German cities. Uh, so the creation of the ghetto uh, was something that some Jews saw as preferable to expulsion. I mean, I'd say even all Jews saw as preferable to expulsion. Uh, and some even saw in the ghetto a kind of, um, a kind of salvation that it allowed the Jews to protect themselves, that it, you know, kind of, contributed to the survival of community, not to its attrition. Uh, so, you know, you see Jews responding to the ghetto in different ways. Uh, but I would say, you know, one core idea that you see kind of underlying Christian anti-Judaism, and I would say the ghetto as well, is a fear of Jewish pollution, a fear of Jewish contamination. And during the early modern period, uh, this is something that goes beyond just Jews. Uh, it has to do with other groups as well, this kind of need to kind of tighten boundaries against heretics, uh, against Protestants. Uh, and so, you know, the Jews are swept up in this as well. So that's how I would answer that question. And in the case of the Nazi, you know, when the, when the ghetto, when the mandatory ghetto is revived under the Nazis, um, here it obviously had, you know, a different, um, I don't know if you want to say function, but a different outcome, uh, which is that the ghettos proved to be way stations uh, to annihilation, whether to the killing fields uh, or to the gas chambers. 
And how can we spot this these anti-Semitic tropes we've been discussing in the current rhetoric on the conflict and American politics? How can we spot anti? Well, I would say, you know, first of all, and look, you know, I mean, I don't know if anybody heard, you know, representative representative Rashida Tlaib's statement the other day, uh, where, you know, essentially she was blaming you know, the big money, you know, this kind of, you know, hidden money uh, for not only contributing to um, discrimination and, you know, against Blacks, but also the whole, you know, Palestinian uh, crisis. Uh, you know, that I would say is an anti-Semitic trope, you know, of associating Jews with money, with kind of like the money behind the curtains, kind of secret money, hidden money, um, you know, I would say anytime there's attempts to kind of call Jews Nazis, to call Zionist Nazis, um, you know, it's not only an attempt to basically almost say you're just as bad as the Nazis were, which is an incredibly offensive thing to say, uh, but it's also an attempt to say you are the epitome of evil. It's like this whole idea of the and the devil that I said is one of these tropes from the Middle Ages that gets resurrected. So, you know, I would say when you see, um, and some of this is applied not just to Israel and Zion, some of it's just applied you know, to Jews, you know, especially on the right. Um, you know, when you see Israel and Zionism put in this position uh, where essentially they kind of are seen as this kind of hidden power, this demonic power, this uniquely evil power, then you're seeing anti-Jewish tropes that are you know, deeply embedded uh, in Western tradition, revived. And would you say that anti-Semitism is currently getting worse in Western societies? And if yes, is this trend in America more worrying on the political right or the left? Um, well, I would, you know, I mean, look, I would say anti-Semitism is worsening. Um, you know, we have a situation now, I mean, it's been the situation in Europe for some time, and now we're seeing the United States as well, where people, you know, who visibly identify as Jewish, you know, typically Orthodox Jews, but not always Orthodox, sometimes, you know, other Jews as well, uh, whether wearing a kippah uh, or wearing just a, you know, a, a high necklace or a Star of David necklace or something like that, uh, feel that they are vulnerable, um, you know, and maybe have second thoughts about doing so that they wouldn't have had, you know, just a, a, a few years ago. Uh, I would say, you know, you have seen, um, you know, a kind of shift toward a kind of anti-Semitic anti-Zionism um, on parts of the progressive left. Um, and certainly, you know, I mean, you know, in the United States, uh, we've seen, you know, a resurgence of white nationalism, uh, you know, in the last several years uh, and really, you know, kind of exploding uh, you know, with the election of Donald Trump in, in 2016. Um, so, you know, I think, I, I personally, which do I think is the greater threat? I think the greater threat um, is anti-Semitism from the right, uh, because first of all, it's more widespread. I mean, there was just a study that was done earlier this summer by a professor at Tufts that did really dug deep uh, into um, attitudes toward Jews on the right and the left and among African Americans, and really did find um, that anti-Semitism is more rife on the right than the left. I would say anti-Semitism is also more violent on the right. There are fantasies of violence. We've seen examples of violence at the Tree of Life Synagogue uh, in Pittsburgh. Um, but I you know, so I would say that is more threatening. Um, 
But I think, you know, you see uh, in the hostility, you know, to any to kind of Jewish particularism, to a kind of Jewish particularism, to, um, to Jewish self-determination on the progressive left that, you know, is also um, attacking what many Jews believe is central to their identity. And, you know, I guess I would prefer sometimes, especially with anti-Zionism, even though I've argued that sometimes it masks anti-Semitism or sometimes it morphs into anti-Semitism, you know, I would say that it'd be better to attack anti-Zionism often as just wrong on its merits than to always kind of label it as anti-Semitism. Because by doing so, you do, in my opinion, genuinely sweep up people who are not anti-Semites. You know, it's too um, broad a brush. That doesn't mean, though, that anti-Zionism can't be critiqued on its own terms as, you know, wrong. Wrong for basically demanding that Jews be the first to kind of wash themselves of national sovereignty in, instead of other, you know, nations. You know, um, wrong in terms of um, supposing that, you know, a one state solution uh, will not lead to violence. You know, I think there's many grounds to critique anti-Zionism. I don't think it always has to be criticized as anti-Semitic. The final question, are you a Zionist? Why or why not? I am a Zionist. Uh, I am a Zionist um, because, well, for a few reasons. First of all, because I believe in the idea of Jewish self-determination in part of the land of Israel. That doesn't necessarily mean all of the land of Israel. And I oppose Israel's nation state law of 2018 for basically arguing that Jews are the only people with a right to self-determination uh, in Israel without specifying Israel's borders. Um, so leaving open the possibility that you're referring to greater Israel. I'm a Zionist because I believe um, in Jewish peoplehood. And I believe that even though this peoplehood is something that should link um, Israeli Jews with Jews around the world, uh, nevertheless, uh, the cradle of it today is the land of Israel, is the state of Israel. Um, there are so many, you know, the revival of Hebrew, um, the existence of so many Jewish cultural institutions um, in the state of Israel. You know, I think, you know, this is something that's very important to, to me as a Jew. Um, and so, you know, for both those reasons, for the reason of believing in the idea of self-determination and believing uh, in Jewish peoplehood, uh, this is why I'm a Zionist. I would describe myself as a liberal Zionist. Uh, I was very, I've been very critical uh, of the Israeli right. Um, I was not a fan of the Netanyahu government. Um, I am you know, opposed to the further creation of settlements. Uh, and, you know, I, and I, and I feel that liberal Zionism is really fighting an uphill battle at this point. Uh, because when I visit Israel, I sense, uh, you know, a kind of slipping into um, a greater Israel, uh, a one state solution, uh, where the essentially the green line, the line that typically demarcated Israel from the territories is essentially being effaced. Uh, and, you know, the conditions for annexation are being laid. Even whether that will happen or not remains to be seen. Uh, but I think that we have moved very far, you know, a two-state solution now, even if I still continue to believe it's the best resolution of the issue seems like a fantasy right now. And perhaps those who are arguing in Israel that we should focus now on shrinking the conflict rather than resolving it are correct. So that is the nature of my Zionism.
Thank you. That's all we have for this evening. Um, Professor Schwartz, thank you so much. Us oh, my pleasure. New Zionist Congress are so grateful for you sharing your time and your wisdom with us tonight. It has truly been an amazing evening. Um, for everyone listening, please make sure to follow New, New Zionist Congress on Twitter at New Zionists, Instagram at New Zionist Congress, and please sign up to become a member of our organization at newzionists.com.